I'm happy to welcome you to Convocation this morning. Uh, we have a special speaker here in Kathleen Norris. Kathleen, who will be introduced in a moment uh, by our own Jamie Osborne, is here as the Beekner lecturer for the year. And uh, the Frederick Beekner Foundation has helped us uh, bring her here, and we're grateful to them for that opportunity. She's been on King twice before and has been, uh, in both cases, has left a mark on this institution for the better. Um, I welcome you to this time of, of quiet and reflection to start. And uh, lots of things to think about as you begin another week here at King. Thank you for being here, and I'm going to turn it over to Jamie Osborne to introduce. Oh. Yes, welcome, Jamie. She deserved a lot better than that. I want to be sure you give her that. Um, also, we have, uh, this is a devotional publication this day, which is uh, for whom one of the editors is Kathleen Norris. And we have a number of these. Uh, if you want one, there uh, will be for free at the back if you're interested in taking one of these with you. This would take you through exams. It would be healthy for your soul at the end of a semester. So I strongly encourage you. These nice daily readings, uh, uh, liturgical readings, as well as reflections by a variety of people. So please do pick up one of these as you go, if you like. Thank you. Acedia. It's an ancient word used to describe spiritual sloth or restlessness and disdain. Although typically used in reference to a solitary lifestyle, it is not a condition solely confined to monastic people. We all go through spells of acedia. We are honored to have Ms. Kathleen Norris with us today. Ms. Norris is a best-selling poet and essayist whose wisdom and passion shines through her work. In her New York Times bestseller, Acedia and Me, Ms. Kathleen Norris uh, carefully, and carefully and beautifully details her experiences with acedia throughout her life. Ms. Norris's studies and life experiences have taken her to many places, from New York to the monastery and back to South Dakota, where she developed a genre of spiritual geography. Through her eloquent prose and spiritual insight, Ms. Norris has touched the hearts and minds of many. Please join me in welcoming Ms. Kathleen Norris. Thank you for coming on this lovely rainy morning. Um, I am honored to be back here. I'm becoming a regular at King College, which is which is fine with me. I got to the Country Music Museum yesterday down, down downtown, which was exciting uh, to see. When I was here four years ago, I believe they were still dreaming of, of doing that, and it was lovely. Um, I think what I'll do this morning, I'd like to start out by reading um, some Bible passages and then preaching on them. And actually, I use the lectionary for today. Uh, if you go, if you go get a copy of Give Us This Day, it'll be in there. And I don't preach a whole lot. I'm not asked to preach a lot. And so I tend to use the lectionary just because it forces me to focus on things that I might not be otherwise focused on. It, it makes me look at Bible passages in another way. And the two uh, passages today both come from the Gospel of Luke. And I'll read both of them. The first one is um, the song that basically the father, Zechariah, the song, uh, the father of John the Baptist, um, sings after. Uh, uh, in, in praise of this child who is to be born, John the Baptist. It's from the first chapter of Luke. Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come and redeemed his people. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. As he said through his holy prophets long ago, salvation from our enemies, from the hand of all who hate us, to show mercy to our forebears and remember his holy covenant, the oath he swore to our father Abraham, to rescue us from the hand of our enemies and to in help us to serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, my child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare the way, to give his people knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins, because of the tender mercy of our God, by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those 
living in darkness and the shadow of death, and to guide our feet into the way of peace. And the second passage is a parable, one of Jesus' parables um, from the Gospel of Luke, the parable of the rich fool, which is a good title, the rich fool. Someone in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, Well, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? Then he said to them, Watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I will do. I will tear down my barns and build even bigger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to myself, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, You fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself, but is not rich toward God. Here ends our reading. If you're good Episcopalians, you would say thanks be to God, but that's okay. You can, you can get away. So I call this talk, What State Are We In? And I suspect that question, what state are we in, is one that you hear a lot in these parts. Are we in Virginia or Tennessee? <laughs> Last night I had dinner on the... I think I was on the Tennessee side and the car parked across the street was in Virginia. So what state are we in is an urgent question here and does, how much does it matter? Well, I think in those two passages from Luke, we meet two people who are in completely different states and it matters a great deal. The farmer is in what we might consider a normal state of satisfaction and even happiness because he's had an extremely successful year. Now, if you know most farmers, they're going to find something to complain about anyway, but this man is, seems totally content. He's, he's very happy, but he's also grown complacent and exalted in his own mind. He's so concerned with building even bigger barns and stocking up for an even more successful future that he's forgotten about God. And I think that's a state that we're often in when things are going well for us. We're happy, we just, but the God stuff just sort of seems to fall away. And that's the state he's in. He's forgotten that everything he has is a gift from the God who made him. He's even forgotten that he's mortal and that one day all of this fabulous wealth that he's accumulated will pass on to others. This parable reminds me of the old joke about how to make God laugh. Just tell him your plans. Fool, this very night your life will be required of you. What then will become of all that you own? And this gospel passage has struck me for many years. I remember, fool, this night you will be required of you. Uh, that's such a powerful statement. And I've, I st I tr I've started to use it as a kind of mantra in many situations in my life. When I travel or if I'm working on a writing project or... It reminds me that in a, there is, in a way, my life is at stake every day and the future is not in my hands. St. Benedict in his Rule for Monks has a powerful line also and he admonishes monks to remember every day that you are going to die. Now some people find this morbid. What a, that's depressing. Remember every day you're going to die. But I've been a Benedictine oblate now for 30 years, and I've come to see that passage as really quite liberating. Because to remember that I and everyone I meet is mortal 
That can kind of help me correct my anger and my impatience. It's hard to stay angry or impatient with someone when you realize, hey, we're in this, we're in this together. We're both mortal. Um, it helps me avoid that farmer's blind pride and to keep things in their true perspective. You might try it sometime. The next time you're stuck in a long line at the Department of Motor Vehicles or a TSA line at the airport, just look at the people around you and remember that they, like you, are all mortal and all beloved children of God. Or you could recall a line of fifth century crazy man named Philo of Alexandria, uh, something he said once that has stuck with me, be kind, for everyone you meet is fighting a great battle. That's another mantra, be kind, for everyone you meet is fighting a great battle. It's a little more cheerful than fool, this very night your life will be required of you, but, <laughs> but I think both of them really do help you keep things in their proper perspective, especially their perspective towards not only other people, but towards God. Well, the second person we meet today is Zechariah, who is soon to be the father of John the Baptist. And unlike the farmer, he's in a highly unusual state, even one of ecstasy. He has been granted, earlier in the gospel, we find he's been granted a visit by God's messenger, the angel Gabriel, who has told him that Elizabeth is to bear a child who will be a precursor of the Messiah. His child will be John the Baptist. And it's a shocking revelation to him because Elizabeth is, they're both old, Elizabeth is past childbearing age, and Zechariah simply can't believe it. And so his doubt earns him nine months during which he is unable to speak. And when that nine months is over, he comes out with that song, that hymn of praise that we heard earlier. Um, he, it's almost as if he'd had his own kind of nine months of pregnancy, and he's gestated this song of thanksgiving and praise that's become one of the most beloved hymns in our sacred scripture. If you are um, in a, any monastery in the world, um, or in a, some Episcopal churches, that song I read earlier, the song of Zechariah, is sung every morning at morning prayer. So it's a song that is sung by, by thousands of people every day all around the world. A wonderful way to greet the morning, to say that we are being guided in the ways of peace. We are going ahead of the Messiah. But to me, this canticle of Zechariah is like a barn whose doors have suddenly been flung open to let an awe-inspiring abundance just flow out, just given to us. Zechariah's song encompasses the entire scope of our salvation history, and it reminds us of so many who have gone before us to prepare the way, not only John the Baptist, but Abraham and Sarah and King David and the prophets. And now comes John, this child who is to know Jesus and even to baptize him. A child who is to tell people that God has promised them salvation through the forgiveness of their sins. And now, instead of asking that logical question that Zechariah asked earlier, how will I know this is so, Zechariah is just so full of wonder that out comes this song of deep gratitude and joy. I think we can probably all think of people we know who are like that farmer, who have grown so complacent in their busy and successful lives that they have no time for God. And maybe we've been in that state ourselves. I know I have, where you sort of neglect your daily prayers. You neglect thinking about God, what God would, would ask of you, because you're so busy with all these other things. And most of us do have very busy lives. So we know that state. We might even think of that as normal. But I hope we can also name people in our lives who are more like Zechariah. Those people who inspire us to remember what God has called us to and what God intends for us. Who remind us that God's even the most unbelievable promises that God makes to us will be fulfilled. People whose faith are, is alive when things are going well and when things are falling apart. 
faith that sees God at work in all things and always, despite sometimes despite the evidence before us, God is always working for the good. Faith that knows that while the plans we make for ourselves might not pan out, God's promises will be fulfilled. So Zechariah may not have much in the way of stored up worldly goods, but he has come to know what it means to be rich in God's blessings and to selflessly pass this good news on to future generations. As I said, every morning, every day around the world, we're reminded of this great song of Zechariah. And I think Zechariah's state is one that we can all aspire to. Amen. You might have realized uh, by the brevity of my preaching that I am not a Baptist. I have never... And in monastery choirs actually has given me probably the greatest trainings uh, in terms of preaching because most monasteries, the Sunday sermon might be like 10 minutes, 12. But during the weekday, the sermons are between three and five minutes. And I've been amazed to find out how much people can work in. And sometimes the people preaching are biblical scholars or they're scholars of Hebrew. They really know a lot and they pack all of that in, their knowledge, they bring it with them, but they do it all in about five minutes. And as a poet, I, I kind of appreciate that. I would make a terrible Baptist. Um, but uh, I want to close, though, with a benediction and to, to send you out with a blessing on your day, because I think that's important to do. And I'm going to do it in the form of a, of a contemporary poem by a poet named Denise Levertov an American treasure who died a few years ago. Um, and I think it relates a little bit to what I've been preaching on. Uh, because the first line is, days pass when I forget the mystery. And that farmer certainly has forgotten the mystery, the mystery of God and everything that's made, that's given to him. It's a poem called Primary Wonder by Denise Levertov. Days pass when I forget the mystery. Problems insoluble and problems offering their own ignored solutions jostle for my attention. They crowd its antechamber along with a host of diversions, my courtiers wearing their colored clothes, caps, and bells. And then once more the quiet mystery is present to me. The throng's clamor recedes. The mystery that there is anything, anything at all, let alone cosmos, joy, memory, everything rather than void. And that, O oh Lord, creator, hallowed one, you still hour by hour sustain it. Amen and blessings on your day. And now we'll. Thank you. I hope you will not forget the mystery today. Uh, let's be like Zachariah. If you want to have some time to chat with Kathleen, she'll be around for a while since we are uh, well ahead of schedule in that good Benedictine tradition. Uh, so she'll be up here at, th at the front for a while. Um, otherwise, go and have a good day. Yeah, I'm going to go sit down. Yeah. That'll make that makes more sense.